Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, Thomas Wolf, the host of the radio program Word In Edgewise at KVMR in Nevada City, and Damian Schiff, a senior attorney at the uh, Pacific Legal Foundation. Uh, we're on the air on Channel 17 Sacramento, www.accesssacramento.org on the web, uh, and on uh, YouTube and on Facebook, noon Friday, 8 p.m. Thursday, uh, and 4 a.m. Saturday, all Pacific time. So welcome to the show. Peter, and I'm going to have you say the name because I forgot it already. Stavriano Dacus. Yeah. Stavriano Dacus. That's okay. an awesome name. That guy uh, has a, a suit against the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife all about the, uh, the uh, discrimination against falconers. What in the world uh, is that all about? It's a Pacific Legal Foundation case, right? It is, and it was actually just um, uh, filed um, about a week and a half ago or so. Under federal law, there are, not surprisingly, a, a lot of rules and regulations about um, uh, possessing, owning raptors, falcons and eagles and what have you. There's the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, there's the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. About 10 years or so ago, the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the federal agency that has responsibility for administering these laws, issued um, a, a set of um, regulations governing uh, in particular, falconry, that is the, 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 the ancient um, uh, sport of, um, of using uh, birds of prey for, um, for a variety of uses in a, a competitive aspect. Uh, these rules... Uh, hunting, basically. Hunting rules, yeah. yeah. But, well, I mean, falconry and hunting, but, but the, the rules that the Fish and Wildlife Service promulgated are uh, particularly burdensome in two respects. Uh, one is that... Uh, in order to get a permit to uh, have a bird at home for falconry, you have to consent to um, basically searches of your premises or facilities at any moment in time. Mm. Unannounced. Just Unannounced. Come in. So you have to give up your Fourth Amendment rights. Yeah. Exactly. And secondly, uh, you're not allowed to use your birds in any sort of media or commercial capacity unless it's limited to very narrow exceptions about uh, basically the bird's biology or what have you. So say you, you wanted to use your, uh, you know, do a film about, um, about falconry or you wanted to do a film about, um, about your hobby and you had the bird in the film with you, uh, that would violate these rules. And so we filed a lawsuit on behalf of of a number of falconers and a falconry organization in federal court here in Sacramento, challenging these permitting rules under the Fourth Amendment mm -hmm. and under the First Amendment. Right. What's the First Amendment issue? The First Amendment issue is, is there are actually several, but the main one is that the government uh, really can't dictate on a content basis right. what you can or cannot do with the the uh, the birds. So it's not as if the, the 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 government's saying we don't want you to use the birds in a way that that they might become injured or what have right. you. The, the government is saying if your message connected with the bird is X, then that's illegal. If your message is Y, then it's okay. And that sort of content they, regulation is how is, do they even justify that? What's the legal justification? Well, we haven't we haven't seen an answer yet from the okay. government, so it'll be interesting to see. Because I, I do think that on that point in particular, uh, it's hard to, to explain uh, what sort of, of 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 compelling interest the government has in limiting the content of 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 a message in which one's own. Um, uh, Pet bird appears. Just appears. Just just seeing the bird on the screen. Is that so alone. So what's the motivation here? Is That's the motivation crazy. we don't think falcon? We think the falcons sh should be wild and free, and they should not be owned by falconers. Or? I mean, I think part of it is is that 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 uh, yes, and, and and certainly an antipathy towards commercial use. Okay, and and what what is the commercial use of uh, falcons? Yeah, I don't or see a lot of that in the marketplace. <laughs> well, I because it's illegal, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I mean, you can get a permit. I, one of the commercial uses is for um, uh, predator control. So, for example, oh. um, farmers might use falcons or airports uh -huh. uh, to target particular nuisance pests. Right. Uh, and but but even even for example, say for our, our league uh, client uh, Peter. Say if he wanted um, to, to be hired by an organization to give a speech about his interest in falconry and, and encouraging others to do it, and say he, he 
uh, the organization wanted to pay an honorarium uh, for his time w with his bird on the stage with him. That would be illegal. Wow, that's under under these these permitting regulations. Because that would harm the bird. Harm well, that's the rationale. But but the regulations say that that you can't make any money off of off of the bird because you're exploiting the bird. Right. So this is about bird exploitation. <laughs> I mean, I suspect that's probably yeah. the justification for the government. But uh, the problem for the government is that its regulation is content sensitive. It's mm -hmm. it's about it's about. Um, prohibiting a certain type of content mm -hmm. and that makes it uh, particularly hard to justify under the First Amendment. So if I brush my dog up and take him to a, a dog show, I'm exploiting the dog. Would, the, would, uh, would they have, be able that to use the, the same logic. rationale? I mean, the same rationale same would rationale apply, right? Same rationale to say no dog shows? Absolutely. Now, there isn't... Particularly if there's a prize involved? There isn't a... Uh, <laughs> yeah, monetary prize. There yeah. isn't a, a law analogous to the the, the, the falconry laws that Don't we're give talking anybody about any ideas. that apply to but, dogs, but the same rationale would lead to that result, I think. So can I just ask on the Fourth Amendment, because we jump right to the First Amendment. The Fourth Amendment issue is obviously a big one as well. So if uh, they, you're automatically consenting to surprise inspections of your domicile or wherever you're keeping the bird, does that mean anything that's discovered is uh, open to if, if absolutely anything in your home that maybe there there would be normally no, would require there, a, uh, there would be no exclusionary as far as I understand there would be no exclusionary rule applicable because it would be a consented search huh. and so if it's if it's found in the normal course of that search then it would otherwise be usable now this is something that's not limited to, to falcons we regularly see even with with just normal uh, local land use permitting agencies. Uh, conditions imposed on, say, a um, uh, the ability to to to, to lease out a, a room in your home, or as a condition to getting a permit to developing along along the coast uh, from the coast commission, there will be conditions put in uh, requiring that you consent to searches hmm. from administrative personnel, ostensibly just to ensure that you're complying with the right. permit. But of course, that doesn't limit what the uh, what the the inspectors can use against you if, in the course of their inspection, they find other things. If they find radical literature, for instance. Exactly. And yeah. so our argument is that uh, there is a, a doctrine in constitutional law called the Unconstitutional Conditions Doctrine. And what this doctrine basically means is that the government can't use its leverage, regulatory leverage, to coerce you to give up a constitutional right. right. So here, it's true, the feds have the authority to regulate these falcons, or at least we're conceding that point. They can't use that regulatory leverage to then extort from the falconer uh, the giving up of other constitutional rights, like the right, right against unreasonable searches right. and seizures. So what kind of, what would, they, what would they be left with? If, if you can hit them on the first and the fourth, what, what else is in there? I, 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 mean, don't know I, I, mean, I mean, under that rationale, the government could say, well, they'll also have to give up their right of free speech. They'll have to give up their right of, 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 of association, of freedom of religion. Yeah. And, and uh, these are all part of the price of getting the permit to, to, to wow. be a legal falconer. So they're trying to get rid of falconry, it sounds like. Or well, just I regulate it out of existence. Certainly, I don't think it's a favored activity, but the government doesn't want to miss the opportunity since they have the permitting process to extract as much as they can. Is it also a money maker? Do you have to pay a lot of money to get these permits? You know, that's a good question. I don't know that offhand. I don't think, I mean, certainly it's not financially prohibitive because that's not, not really uh, what our client's concern is. It's, it's the conditions that are attached to the permitting yeah. process. The California Cattlemen's Association versus the California Fish and Game Commission. This is about another species. This one, uh, uh, the gray wolf. Um, I was, I was uh, hiking up in uh, the uh, uh, Caribou Wilderness, up the east of uh, Lassen Wilderness, and was told by some ranchers that I ran into up there, uh, that uh, are, with whom I had a, a mutual acquaintance with somebody that used to, used to be a friend of Pacific Legal Foundation, interestingly enough. But anyway, we had a conversation, and they were saying that there are a lot of introduced wolves, wolves that have been brought in by environmental organizations ostensibly, uh, into that part of the world and, uh, and fitted with bracelets that will have exploding ink in them so that if you uh, shoot the wolf, 
you better you better you better wound it because if you don't kill it if you kill it it's going to the, the the ink will explode and you'll have you you know they'll they'll get you. Uh, anyway, they were saying that it's it's a huge issue trying to protect your cattle against introduced wolves. Now that's not what this is about. This is about one lone gray wolf sighting. Right. Uh, used as an excuse to do what? To uh, the immediate uh, result is that the gray wolf based upon the presence of, of a single wolf that crossed the border a few years ago from Oregon, uh, to list the wolf under the California Endangered Species Act. But the long-term consequence is that it will really be impossible, given that decision in California, for a reasonable wolf management plan to be put in place. So, so to give a little more context, the uh, California Endangered Species Act is a lot like the Federal Endangered Species Act. It, it's designed for the protection of um, of imperiled wildlife. But this is an unusual case because never before have you had an instance where the Fish and Game Commission, which is the agency that makes these decisions in this state, never before have you had, had a circumstance where based upon the presence of a single animal, mm -hmm. the commission says, ah, well, if there's only one person, that, one animal left in, in the population in this <laughs> state necessarily, it must be endangered, so we have to list it regardless of whether this particular animal ever settles down. And in fact, the, the wolf on which this listing was based ultimately settled down, he's still alive, uh, settled down in Oregon. And as far as I know, hasn't been back in the state for, for, for some time. Uh, but the environmentalists like, like to, 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 to paint this, this controversy as one of, of whether we want to protect the wolf or strip the wolf of protections and, and have open season on the wolf like any other game animal. And that really isn't, isn't a fair characterization. What the case is about is not stripping the wolf of protections. There will be a lot of federal and state protections that will apply to the wolf regardless of how our case ends up. But what it is about, as I said before, is management. Because under the old regime, before this listing happened, if a wolf regularly attacked a rancher's cattle mm -hmm. or otherwise harmed his property, he could, in theory, apply for a permit from the state to have the wolf removed or to kill the wolf. Mm -hmm. But because of the listing now of the wolf under the state's Endangered Species Act, those permits are not legally possible. There is no effective way for a rancher to fight back. In fact, it would even be illegal for a rancher to get on his horse and to try and drive a wolf away, not even harming the wolf, just sort of trying to scare him away. Even that sort of active, uh, non-lethal activity would be illegal, would in fact even be a felony. And so our argument is that, A, the listing is, 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 is based on, on faulty legal analysis, but B, it's just really bad policy that, that you can protect the wolf while at the same time protecting human beings and their property. But that's not possible under the current regime. So they're indigenous to Oregon or Washington, up north, right? Not even, well, not even, this, that, that's what makes this particularly um, troubling is that the wolf that came into California and all the wolves that are in Oregon mm. are derived from a population of wolves that the Fish and Wildlife Service transplanted from Canada into Idaho in the 1990s. And they did, they did very well, and the wolves have then migrated from Idaho to Oregon, and now they're starting to go from Oregon to California. But the point is, these are wolves from Canada. They are a subspecies of wolf that is larger and much more aggressive and voracious mm -hmm. than any type of wolf that would have been in California well, historically, indigenous. indigenous. Yeah. And so then you have really the, the, the perverse result of a statute that's designed to restore native wildlife and native ecosystems right. that's being used actually to protect what amounts to an invasive subspecies. Huh. Huh. I... <laughs> but they have cute pups, I bet. They do, and, and, and what, what I, I never ceases to amaze, me, to amaze me is that you look at the environmentalist petition that led to this wolf listing. What do you have on the cover of, of that petition? You have a, a she-wolf nuzzling in a very cute way a, 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 a wolf cub. And the, uh, the clear import is that, um, you know... Puppy the, killers. The, exactly. Yeah. And that the concern that ranchers have is overblown, and that's really not now, right. The fact that this is one wolf and the wolf has left California is no longer... Does that mean there's no Well, you would think. Anymore? I mean, you would think that that would mean, well, now the wolf is extinct in California, and so right. we can get rid of the listing, but... The, he uh, might come back. Huh? He might come back. And, and to be fair, since that, that listing happened uh, six, four, four or five years ago, w there has been evidence of other wolves who have come down, gone back. 
Hmm. But the point is that it's all ephemeral. It's all transient. Nobody sure. can really say, oh, we definitely have an established wolf population in the state. Right. And our argument is that really, why are we wasting our scarce wildlife conservation resources on something that's so transient? Right. Why don't we wait until there's an established an population? Problem. Well, is so there, is there, are, there, are there native wolf populations in California? Historically, yes. There, there were uh, yeah, in... Mm -hmm. Yosemite, right? The, the, uh, Yosemite and other parts of the state, the last native wolf, so to speak, uh, was, that was known uh, was shot in the 1920s, I believe, hmm. or found dead. In okay, and, and they don't exist elsewhere? The 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 the, 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 the the subspecies of wolf that used to be here is is, is now extinct. Mm. Okay. So there is a possibility that this gray wolf will go extinct without without the environmental intervention. No, that's not. You know, I mean, the the gray wolf as a species, range wide, which actually includes not just North America but Eurasia as well, mm -hmm. is nowhere near. I mean, Canada alone, there the, the wolf is 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 prolific. So, okay, so there's no real danger of extinction of the species no, it's, itself. It's at the same thing, actually, like, for example, with the bald eagle. You know, the mm -hmm. bald eagle was never going to go extinct because there are tons of them in Alaska and Canada. Mm -hmm. It's just that in the lower 48, for some time, their, their population dwindled. Yeah. Uh, another uh, interesting uh, case that you're working on is the Massachusetts Lobstermen's Association uh, versus Ross. The best way to describe this case is land is now water or water is now land. There is um, a, an old act, over 100 years old, called the Antiquities Act. It was passed in the early part of the 20th century. Basically, the point of the law was there were instances of vandalism of various um, important um, uh, uh, historic sites in the right. Southwest. And so Congress passed a law giving the president the authority, basically, to create many national monuments through presidential proclamation. And that statute says that um, this power to create these monuments these uh, through executive order is limited to those lands, federal lands, owned or controlled by the federal government. Lands owned or controlled right. by the federal government. What happened uh, a few years ago? The Obama administration designated uh, an area about the size of Connecticut off the coast of New England. Off the coast. Off the coast. As it's a Georgia's Bank, a right? marine national monument. Exactly. It's a Georgia's Bank, which is one of the most prolific fishing grounds in, in, in the Atlantic. And is it, not a federal, that doesn't fall under the, the description. No, it's for one thing, it's certainly not land. For another thing, it's yeah. not even within the territorial sea. We're talking about hundreds of miles off the coast. Yeah. So I it's mean, not even part of the United States territory? The most that the government can say it, is that it's within our exclusive economic zone. Oh, so this is an economic thing. And that's, that's got to be the case. Then. And that is the, the rationale the government has offered, is that because it, it's part of our exclusive economic zone, we have some control over the area, even though technically it's not land, it's water, and therefore we can designate this area as a monument. Why do we care? Well, our clients are a collection of fishermen whose livelihoods are basically ended mm -hmm. because as a result of this monument, marine monument, Fishing, commercial fishing, is effectively banned. Hmm. And so you have the industry on the ropes as a result of what we think is, is, is a clearly unauthorized uh, designation. Now, I should, should emphasize to the viewers that it's not as if prior to President Obama, uh, this power was used uh, judiciously and, and sparingly. Hmm. Many presidents have used this power to designate large, large areas as monuments and, as a, and, 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 and taking areas out of productive use. But this particular marine monument I, I to, was, I, was I, egregious. I seem to remember that during the Clinton administration, a large part of Utah was taken, was turned into a monument. Yes. Uh, which coincidentally uh, produced a, a mineral that his, uh, uh, some foreign contributors of his also produced. Uh, no, that's, I, th that connection I, I wasn't aware. But for example, under the George W. Bush administration, there was a substantial marine monument designated off the coast of Hawaii. So it, it, it's not a partisan thing. It's really more of a presidential power problem mm -hmm. that, the, that the presidency is just such that... that um, uh, we can do this, so we will. Right. But our argument, as I say, is you've got to draw a line somewhere. I mean, sure, there may have been abuses in the past, but at this point, if water is land, then there really 
is no limitation on the president saying, Richard, your house is now, a, a, is now a, an antiquities monument, and well, you've got to get that out. that happens, you know. Oh, yeah. It does. It, yeah, it does yeah, happen. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just well, let me, let me ask you a question a little bit different from more, more of an environmentally sensitive uh, standpoint. Right. Uh, there are a lot of areas uh, where you, uh, there, that are uh, fishing grounds or, or coral reefs or whatever that are declared marine sanctuaries with, yes. uh, with uh, regulations on commercial fishing to prevent uh, or prevention of commercial fishing and that sort yeah. of thing. Uh, is, is, it not, is, is what they're doing not analogous to that, except the form is different? Well, the outrageous thing is, is that there is a federal law that allows that to be done, and the fact that that was not used here really shows you that the president's trying to do an end run, because this federal law that authorized marine sanctuaries also has a lot of procedural protections in it. Oh, right. To oh. give Oops, yeah, affected yeah. people an opportunity to have a say. Yeah. There's nothing like that under the Antiquities Act. Just do it. Exactly. No, and, and so, and so yeah, it's yeah. not even a question of do we want to protect the area. It's really a question of do we want the president wielding arbitrary power at, at the consequence of significant economic harm to our citizens. But is that the rationale? Is it that the, they say there's overfishing in that area? No. What, the what are they trying to do? What the rationale trying? is that there are um, um, sea, what they call sea mounts. Uh, on sea, the sea mounts? Sea, yeah, sea mounts. Mount. Uh, mount. Uh, like a mountain. Uh, right. Yeah. yeah uh, on, on the, the seabed, yeah. oh. and that they are um, ecologically significant, and that there is an important ecosystem that relies upon the, this under, underwater topography. Okay. But uh, the rejoinder is that, sure, that's great. You can protect those all you want. The fishing is not going to affect the, the, the uh, seabed itself. Right. So all those things that, that, that they've said we want to protect are not inconsistent with allowing fishing. Right. But nevertheless... This designation says not just the mounts themselves, but the water around it as well is a, is a no fishing zone. Huh. Even though there's nothing to do, fishing has nothing to do with the, with the uh, uh, preservation of those seamounts. No, no, but it does certainly have a role to play with, um, with an environmentalist attitude, I think, that is, is, um, is um, uh, antagonistic to commercial fishing. Anti, anti fish eating? Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, species or substitute species, what difference does it make uh, is, is the next uh, topic. Uh, tell, tell me what that's all about. Again, uh, we were talking about the Endangered Species Act earlier, the California Endangered Species Act, but all these endangered species legislation, whether it's federal or state, it's, they're almost always based upon uh, first identifying, well, what's the relevant population? And the reason why this is important is because it's a matter of common sense. As we're talking about, if you have a wolf, just one wolf, naturally, if that's the population, he's pretty endangered because yeah. <laughs> once he goes, then the whole population is gone. From well, he's going to go anyway if there's only one, right? Yeah, well, that's exactly. true. <laughs> but but the, the idea is, is that, that really you can create an endangered population from any population if you define it narrowly enough. And that idea has been used by some So people groups. who have short hair and gray beards and uh, blue sport coats could be in, uh, an endangered species. Yeah. Endangered. It, it, I think you should do that because I want to live forever. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so the, the, the concern, though, is that you have then some groups gaming the system. They realize, ah, oh, well, we don't like this project. How are we going to stop this project? Well, there are no endangered species on the property, but maybe we can convince the government to consider the little population of squirrels that dwell on this property as its own population worthy of protection, significantly different from other squirrels, that it should be classified differently. Hmm. And because you only look at that little population, you can say, well, they're endangered. That is a, is a dynamic that we see too often played out. And so we at Pacific Legal Foundation have asked the feds to promulgate consistent and reasonable definitions for how you divide up these populations to, to sort of end right. the gamesmanship. That's fair. And that we think, fair. yeah, we think that's something, frankly, that, that even the other side should support because right. you, you, to allow inconsistency ultimately really only helps the government. It doesn't really help anybody else. Right. And whoever's in charge of the government, ha it'll be the whim of whoever's in charge at that moment. Exactly. San Diego Unified Port District versus the California Coastal Commission. The, the Coastal Commission uh, is uh, saying that uh, uh, if you want to build out a, a hotel complex, you also have to have some low-cost visitor accommodations and do they actually specify that they should be that yurts should be part of yurts? <laughs> yes, in fact, that's how they how they they try to get around the legal prohibitions on that that demand is that uh, 
Uh, the California Coast Commission, as I'm sure many of your viewers know, is a very um, uh, imperious uh, uh, state agency here in California. And uh, as, as a consequence, the legislature actually limited its authority about 30 years ago to prevent the commission from setting hotel room rates. The commission doesn't have the authority right. to set those rates. But the commission has decided, well, we can get around that by saying, well, we're not setting room rates. We're just telling you what type of structure you can build. But we all know that if you build a yurt, you're not going to be able to charge very much for people to, 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 to spend their, their family vacation in San Diego <laughs> in. And unfortunately, the California Court of Appeal upheld that and said that it's okay for the Coast Commission to say, you can only build hostels, you can only build yurts, you can only build campsites, even if the real purpose of the commission is to demand lower cost housing. But this is part of a larger problem, Richard, that we see throughout California. The idea of tying, somehow saying that people who develop market rate housing, whether it's short term, long term, condos, houses, what have you, people who develop market rate housing are somehow responsible for the affordable housing crisis. And therefore, they can be compelled as a condition to building their new units for, to provide a quote unquote affordable units. Now, I think we all understand as a first principle of economics, if you think the price is too high, the way to reduce the price is to increase the supply of the relevant unit. Mm -hmm. So if you are creating new housing, how can that worsen the affordable housing crisis? Right. But yet that's the cause and effect relationship. And that's not really what they want. They want to minimize the number of people who are housed. And they don't want to have to raise taxes in order to provide affordable housing. So they huh. disproportionately burden individual property owners who want to develop their property with that obligation. Deep pockets, I'm guessing. Deep pockets, yeah. Last uh, couple of minutes, Pasetta LLC versus the town of Ponce Inlet. Uh, a uh, uh, developer was given a uh, lot of promises to uh, put in a development. The uh, council uh, changed uh, members and they, they reneged on all the promises. Is that basically the nutshell? That is the, the nutshell. And what's really galling about this case it comes out of Florida. Uh, the Supreme Court just denied review in it. What's really galling is the jury awarded, I think, a $30 million verdict in favor of the property owners. Huh. And that was reversed by the Florida Court of Appeal. Oh, and where does okay. it go from there, if anywhere? We, we, we asked the U.S. Supreme Court to take it up, and the court denied review. That's so. too bad. That is That's the show for tonight. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint www.accesssacramento.org, 8 p.m. Thursday, noon Friday, 4 a.m. Saturday, uh, and uh, on YouTube and Facebook. Thank you very much for being on the show.